Hello everyone and welcome back to the Great Book of Grudges. My name is Nathan and today we're going to carry on our missing character series. Interestingly enough, we're going to cover demons. I know I said I wasn't going to do this for a while, but I've been painting up a bunch of demons lately and I've kind of got that itch, you know, I want to talk about them because some of these characters are actually quite cool. So as usual, these are characters that we could expect as legendary lords or maybe even legendary heroes for the mono god faction roster. While I'm expecting a lot of Warriors of Chaos to go there because there's a lot of Warriors of Chaos characters, it'll be kind of cool to see some more demons too, as originally these were intended to be demon factions. So with that being said, let's talk about some of the coolest demon characters that exist in the lore. So we're going to start off with Korn, which might not be the most interesting to most, but I've been painting around 160 blood letters recently and I've still got blood crushes to do and a lot of other stuff, so I'm currently on a pretty big Korn kick. Anyways, for this we obviously have to talk about Skulltaker, an exalted blood letter, which yes, I know might not sound again too interesting considering that we have Scarbrand and stuff, but this is a character that's very different from other Korn demons. You see, Skulltaker is more of a duelist rather than an outright killer. Yes, he kills and he does that very, very well because Corn Demon, but he prides himself on traveling not only the immortal but also mortal planes in an effort to fight and defeat the best fighters around. So for context, Say that you are a Imperial who is very well known as a duelist, who is very known for your jousting capabilities, anything really. Well, there's a chance that Skulltaker might find out about you and he will show up to challenge you to combat. This is a big thing here, you're hearing challenge because this is an honourable duel. He will actively try and find out the best fighters and challenge them to an honourable 1v1. Which might sound a bit strange considering that, well, from what we know from Cornate Demons, they just kind of go in and kill indiscriminately. But Skulltaker focuses on the most coveted of prizes, the skulls of the best fighters around. And you can tell that from his lore when you look at the army book and stuff, he will show up in front of Dwarf Halls, Bretonian Castles, Ogre Settlements, anything really, and challenge. He'll literally just stay there until someone accepts his challenge. He's got the time, he's immortal, you know, he's a demon. But I think this is what makes him such an interesting character, because he's just got the time. He will go out and try to fight whoever possible, because those skulls will probably get him more favour from Korn, but also it can test his abilities. It's very rare that he loses. In fact, I think the only time that he's actually lost in lore was versus Sigmar himself in the battle at the World's Edge Mountains. And because of that, he does have a bit of a vendetta against Sigmar and the Imperials and will go and actively try to find their skulls. But hey, if you constantly win and then you lose, I guess you will harbour some sort of a grudge, won't you? Anyways, I like this character, I think he looks really cool. He had a model update in Age of Sigmar, which makes him look a little bit better than the clunky old one. Still love the old one, don't get me wrong. The fact is that the character models for demons generally looks quite good. If it was a character that the sculptor had a lot of interest in, you can tell that with Skulltaker. It's just a really, really cool model. Anyways, if we see this implemented as a character in the Tilted War series, it's very likely he will be a Legendary Lord, mostly because we need more Legendary Lords for the Korn Monogod faction. Right now, we only have one at the time of recording this video. Same with all the other Monogod factions, but yeah, we can expect some, you know, characters coming in and being implemented because it just kind of makes sense. And Korn is kind of a fun faction to play. Really, I'd say that the Korn 8 Monogod faction is probably one of the best factions in terms of completeness. They just need a little bit of an update here and there, and they're pretty much sorted. But yeah, let's go back to Skulltaker. So, I'd say he'd be a legendary lord, because it just kind of makes sense. And it's a character that really could lead armies. Like, yeah, even Scarbrand didn't lead armies in lore, and yet we still have him leading armies here. So I wouldn't say that it's out of the question for Skulltaker to have his own personal retinue of blood letters, exalted blood letters. This would be the perfect time to bring in something completely new, and I would say blood letters with additional hand weapons, because that would be freaking cool to have dual-wielding blood letters. Obviously some sort of mechanic which focuses on hunting down other characters with some sort of skull taking mechanic which would be cool and then something like that could also be reused to do a head taking mechanic for Queek because you know skull taking head taking kind of similar. Even then we already have a skull mechanic for Korn which is you know skulls but this would be skulls of important characters which could give you faction wide buffs for a while or even character buffs. 
the idea is just to have something different because I'm imagining that DLC characters for the Monogod factions will have their own unique mechanics because this is how it's always worked for the series where we have basic mechanics even though the Monogod factions have really really cool mechanics for the base game Legendary Lords and then something else when a DLC character comes into effect. This is everything that we've seen through the lifespan of Warhammer 2 mostly. But yeah, Skulltaker even has his own mount which is a Juggernaut so yeah don't expect like a unique mount it would just be a differently painted juggernaut maybe with some different things here i don't think the mount option was ever an official mini though i can only really remember him on foot which i mean it's a cool model on foot but the mount option should also be available considering that the juggernaut is decently fast and if it's just going to be a duelist character you know he's going to be good for killing characters it would be good if he could actually move around quickly across the battlefield to hunt down said enemies so we're going to move on to Zinch now, and we're going to talk about the Changeling. This is a character that we've mentioned a lot on this channel, mostly because we can expect him to be a DLC versus the Monkey King. There's loads of hints about that in the game, and I mean, it's the Changeling. He's really, really cool. Let's talk about what makes him special. So, he's a horror. Yeah, he's actually a horror, but this is the thing. He's very, very unique. So let's talk about this, right? This is a horror that can change shapes, which is common, but he can change shapes constantly. He can be able to infiltrate enemy lines, start wars, and he has started wars before between factions because he's decided to take the shape of a character and just instigate something. He's been known to be able to go into, say for example, the Palace of Sinesh and even steal stuff from different Chaos Gods. He is almost untouchable. This is what makes the character so cool, because... The character has been able to change shapes for so long, he's even forgotten his own name. Hell, even Zinch might not even know his name. But this is what makes the character so incredibly curious. It's a complete enigma, and again, new model. It's had a new update. The old one didn't really age too well, but we can always expect the newer models to be the representative of characters if we see them in Total War, as that's what happens already with, like, say, the Suneshi Demons and stuff. They've used the Age of Sigma variant instead of the one Fantasy one. Anyway, since we know that he's able to just sneak around everywhere, this could present some interesting mechanics that we'll get into a bit later, but we've seen this. He's gone into the God of Nurgle and stolen a rot apple. He's gotten into the Palace of Sunesh and stolen a lock of Sunesh's hair. This is just really, really fun because Zinch is a lot of trickery and nothing says trickery more than a shapeshifter, which is why I think it's just really, really cool. I've always loved this miniature. I've loved the lore about him and everything. And we've had hints. Even in the Lorebeards podcast, we've had hints uh, with Andy Hall where the Changeling is kind of active. He kind of takes the guys off the monkey. Monkey King because that can illegitimize anything to do with the Monkey King so it's a very big rivalry that you can already get there in the form of a DLC and Cafe versus Zinch might be kind of interesting. Zinch already has a decent amount of roster and it would be cool to see some new stuff being implemented stuff that we'd seen in Warhammer the Old World. Cafe is in desperate need of DLC too so Cafe could get the most attention here which would be really beneficial for Cafe. Zinch again almost complete roster barring new stuff that's already needed hell we even have new stuff already because those doom knights aren't in the tabletop in terms of any unique mechanics i don't know you see when you played him on the tabletop you'd get into combat and he would take the shape of the enemy you'd take their stats essentially you would mirror the enemy which would give you their benefits and i think that was really really cool because this would mean that you could turn your changeling into a blend of vampire lord if you're fighting them and kind of even the scales which kind of really screwed with the other enemy army. I think something like that would be very, very cool. We have transformation mechanics, we do. I wonder if this could be done in such a way like that. Kind of mirroring it? I don't know, we're gonna have to wait and see. The technology could clearly be there. I know some modders are kind of figuring out how to work that. We've even had it implemented in such a way where he just turns into different monsters of Zinch getting their abilities. This was in one of the mods, I believe, in the Legendary Characters one. But we're going to have to wait and see. I just like the model. I honestly think he looks really, really cool. Uh, the new one is something that I need to paint up. I desperately need to paint up eventually when I get my Zinchian army done. Um... Yeah, I have a lot of models to paint, if you haven't realized that by now, but I, I think you guys have. Unlike every other character, which is, oh, it's a possibility to see it, you'll see through this video, 
this character, I imagine, is, like, almost certain. I think that Creative Assembly even have plans to already do a DLC with the Monkey King and the Changeling because of the hints, and it's literally just a matter of time at this point, really. Next, we're going to go on to my favourite Chaos God, and we're going to talk about the Mask of Sunesh, a character which, once again, had a model update, and I think it looks much better for it. So, what makes this character so special? Well, it's a demonette, and essentially, she had a very interesting role. Rather than being a demonette that was there to fight, she was there to entertain Sunesh, dancing at the Dark Prince of Pleasure's amusement. This was all well and good until one time where Sunesh got humiliated in battle, and while the mask tried to dance to make Sunesh feel better, Sunesh took it as an insult and cursed the mask to dance eternally and never be able to stop. Forgiveness with the Chaos Gods is not really one of their strong suits. Anyway, so now she moves around, she dances across the known world, sometimes in the Immortal Plains too. She can be found pretty much anywhere, and the idea is she's there to cause havoc. That's what a demon does, right? And her dances themselves are quite powerful. Apparently they have such a aura about them that even demon or mortal man will actually dance along to them. So the character itself acts by itself, right? It doesn't really lead armies, but this is a thing. A lot of characters that we do have in the Total War series, so say for example Deathmaster Snake Itch, even Scarbrand, they don't really lead armies, but they are able to. So I imagine that the mask could lead armies, commanding an army of demonettes that dance to the sway of the music that only she can hear in an effort to try and regain favor from Sunesh. And this would be a kind of fun campaign. You could probably pit her against anyone else. How she could even be an FLC Lord. I think out of all the characters that we've spoken about at the moment, yeah, this could be an FLC. You never know, you never know. Creative Assembly could have plans, Games Workshop could have a bunch of new demons that we haven't seen, because uh, the demon rosters are pretty much done. This is a big problem, because the demons never really had new units for a long time, as... Nah, Games Workshop don't really like to implement new stuff. It's a, it's a bit of a weird thing. But the dancers could easily work as some sort of mechanic, very similar to that of Festus. You know that Festus has those two passive abilities that would give him bonuses or do damage to the enemy. You could have all the different dancers like that and you could just pick and have a cooldown between them. I mean, that kind of works. It's kind of hard to justify these types of characters. It's easier to justify like a living mortal of Sunesh rather than a demon because the demons are pretty much done, like I said. And when it comes to Sunesh, the more interesting demon characters, Nakari and Azazel, we already have. But I love the character. I don't know, maybe as a legendary hero could be cool. I like the idea of a legendary lord or a legendary hero. I just want to see more characters for all the monogod factions, because right now it's feeling a little bit bare. I know it's still pretty early. We've only just really kickstarted the lifespan of Total War Warhammer 3. But, you know a faster release schedule, more characters all around, it would just be kind of nice. And yes, I'm going to show some preferential favor towards Sunesh because it's my favorite Chaos God. All right, so now we're going to talk about Nurgle, and we really only have one. Um, it's a bit of a shame. I don't know why, but Nurgle didn't receive a lot of attention during Warhammer Fantasy, but this is Epidemius. He's a plague bearer, as you can expect. He's a herald of Nurgle, which is why you're looking at him going, well, we already kind of had that because the heralds can already mount on the um, palanquins and stuff, but hey, let's talk about the character because he's different, I guess, when you compare him to most others. Essentially, what he is is an accountant. Yeah, that's the best way I can describe it because what he does is he dedicates himself to counting all the demon-infested plagues that rot the world, even the mortal plagues, the natural ones, and he, aided alongside a group of nugglings, just kind of note what they do, what they are, how they work, if they're effective or not. I know this might not sound interesting, but it's kind of weird in a good way, because it shows that Nurgle isn't seeing everything that's going around. The information itself is actually quite important to Papa Nurgle, so his job is actually very, very important. So if you've got an accountant friend, you know, that's your Epidemius, essentially. This is a character that I would say would fall under a legendary hero footing, mostly because, um, well, he's not really that special. But, I don't know, maybe he could be better for the plague stuff, right? So as you start noticing plagues, you get better bonuses from them, you get boons from Papa Nurgle yourself, if he became a sort of legendary lord. But I see him as a legendary hero. He looks cool, and it's a shame that we do have the palanquin model. I will be very honest there, it's a bit of a shame, considering that 
this should have been brought in with Epidemius, right? Let's be very, very honest. Now, you might be wondering why I'm not talking about characters such as, like, I don't know, uh, Tamokon. We talked about them in a previous video. Or, you know, uh, Gut Rot Spume. But those are mortals. When it comes to demons, Nurgle didn't really get that much attention. A lot of mortal characters, but not a lot of attention when it came to demons. But this is a cool character, it's just he doesn't really have a lot of lore. This is a thing that happened a lot in Warhammer Fantasy where characters would get implemented, and that's it. We'll come in with a quick bonus here, as we do have a rather interesting Nurgle demon prince known as Alcor. It's a demon prince character which unfortunately never had a model, and was featured quite heavily in some of the Orion books, and... Really, what this character is known for is almost summoning Nurgle into Athaloran and destroying Athaloran. So this is a character who is fought against the forces of Snorri Whitebeard, which is Scrumbrindle. Hell, even Prince Malekith also. And this was during an allegiance between Zinch and Nurgle, which I know sounds really surprising, but these things do happen. However, a lot of... Zinchian trickery came into effect and Nurgle ended up pretty much losing, but the character carried on. The character was still not destroyed and actively worked against Athaloran and pretty much anything that was around the area. The Orion books are pretty cool, by the way, so you should check them out if you ever get the chance. But at this point, the character was trying to sabotage the rebirth of Orion, was trying to spread a plague into Athaloran and destroy the spore spirits in there. It's a cool character, which it would be interesting if they decided, oh, let's just create this character and shape it. Obviously, Games Workshop's approval is needed here, but it would be kind of interesting to see a Wood Elf vs. Nurgle DLC. It would be introducing some new stuff, some missing stuff for the Wood Elves, and really, it's just trying to find something that has the most backstory, because believe it or not... This character, even though we haven't really gone into a lot of detail, which we will when eventually I start talking about Nurgle in like a lot of detail, this character actually has the most lore out of all Nurgle characters, I'd say. Yeah, barring Tamakon, of course. But we're going to end this video off with the Blue Scribes, a rather interesting pair. And this might not sound too interesting, but the fact is, these two blue horrors are actually quite important in older lore, not so much new lore. So the story goes that one time, a long, long time ago, Zinch was the greatest of all the Chaos Gods. But, obviously, with the great game being into effect, the other Chaos Gods bound together and shattered Zinch into thousands and thousands of pieces. Each of these pieces actually fell onto the world and became what was known as the magical spells. So the spells that people use is basically Zinch. This is why when you go into older content creators such as myself, YouTube channels or Twitch streams, you hear, oh yeah, magic is just basically Zinchian anyway. It's older lore, which is possibly no longer canon. It depends on how you look at it. But a lot of us oldies think of it as, oh yeah, it's all pretty much fragments of Zinch. So what's the job of the Blue Scribes then? So what they have to do is just basically go around the world and collect these shards, learn every spell to essentially reform Zinch and put him back into the height of his power. But Zinch is a smart demon, right? He knows that having a demon learning how Zinch himself works would be a bad thing. He could essentially be replaced. So the both twins were created, one who can learn all the spells but never use them, and the other one who can use the spells but never learn them. And yeah, they travel across the immortal and mortal planes trying to reform Zinch. However, this is something that's going to take a long, long time because there's loads of different laws of magic, and yeah, you know, it's going to be one of these things that possibly just never gets done in an alternate universe. End times is a thing. But should they ever learn everything, right, if they get all the spells, Zinch will just simply swallow them whole and reform himself, which would probably cause a cataclysm large enough to basically destroy the world anyway. But I kind of like the idea of this, and I love throwbacks to old lore. Yeah, sure, this is probably no longer canon anymore, but... You know, it's just cool, right? And cool factor is a cool thing. I, I love the miniatures. I always really did like the blue scribes. And if they get implemented, it's probably going to be as legendary heroes because it kind of makes sense. But yeah, man. I mean, why aren't there more characters like this, right? Even then, very, very little amount of lore. I think they've only got enough lore from the 8th edition army book. Did they have a entry in the 7th? Which was probably copy-paste anyway. 
it's a shame that we don't really get loads of characters getting fleshed out. Hopefully the old world will flesh out these characters a lot more and maybe flesh out some new demons. It really depends on what Games Workshop themselves want. This is the issue. When we're looking to games like Total War Warhammer and stuff, we're at the mercy of Games Workshop and generally how they used to flesh out Warhammer Fantasy. It's a big thing. This is why Helm and Ghost has like three lines of lore. Hell, even Korgath has like, what? Three lines. These are all still really, really cool characters, and there's a lot more. One day I'll start doing like a proper series where we'll just do deep dives into each of the factions, um, because there's just so much to talk about. But let me know what you guys think about these demons. Let me know if you'd like to see them in the form of DLC, FLC, would they be legendary lords, legendary heroes? What demons did I miss that you guys think are essential for the series? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below and let's start a bit of a discussion. And until then, I shall see you all again very, very soon. Have a good day.